What's up, going enthusiasts? Welcome to my coverage of Game 9 and the Game of Blood and Tears. So far, the score is 5 games won by Zhu Jingyu and 3 games won by Huang Longshi in a 3-stone match. Um, I haven't talked so much about the players themselves so far in these commentaries. I've just been talking about their um, activities as players rather than their activities as people and their lives as people. And I think it's very interesting to get to know these people just as much as we get to know them as players. Huang Longshi, he actually grew up relatively poor, especially in comparison to Zhu Jingyu, which is a relatively wealthier man. Huang Longshi grew up in a town and he made a name for himself by becoming good at Go. And eventually he got some odd jobs. He was an attendant to one of the equivalents of princes. I mean, uh, obviously in 1600s China, they didn't have a uh, prince in the way that you're likely to imagine it if I say that word in the West, but um, he was the attendant to one of these princes and he uh, had, you know, was basically brown nosing him in order to get more Go manuals. He'd be like, hey, you've achieved enlightenment, prince. And the prince would be happy. And he'd be like, all right, you can read this. this way. <laughs> so he gets access to all the highest quality Go education. Um by himself, right? By his own efforts and, and um, grew to become one of the greatest players from the ground up. Eventually one of the top players came came through, came to uh, play him. There were rumors that this guy is, is, is getting pretty good as a young prodigy, a young talent. And then the top player was like, all right, I'll give you two stones and we'll play a seven game match and we'll see how you do. And then Huang Longshu won all seven games. <laughs> Which implies, of course, that Huang Longshi should be not just, like, equal to the guy, but it should be better. I mean, if I gave someone two stones and they beat me seven times in a row, I wouldn't think that they were just as good as me. I'd think they're probably better. So, um, <laughs> Huang Longshi was already getting, getting very famous and everyone was like, oh my god, this guy is so insane. People were like, this is, this is not human. This is a heavenly sage descended to the earth and, uh. Even Zhu Jingyu, he always spoke well of Huang Longshi, even in, in his, like, <laughs> sort of secret flaming people diary. I, that's the, the way I would translate it. You know, people like to gossip. They're like, this guy's no good, that guy's no good, that guy doesn't know how to attack, etc. Zhu Jingyu only wrote good things about Huang Longshi. He never flamed him once in his entire life. <laughs> and I think part of that is because Zhu Jingyu had Huang Longshi as a live-in teacher. As I said, Zhu Jingyu is a wealthier man, a more... Uh, political guy, and Huang Longshi was, I mean, he was just a dude who loved Go. <laughs> and um, so these two, they lived together, I'll continue playing, playing forward in the game. And of course, these games of blood and tears, I don't know exactly what time controls they had, because probably they didn't have any time controls. They were just playing the game as each of them were available to play, and uh, this may have been over the course of months. It could have just been relatively close to each other. But um, these is, games were basically part of what Huang Lingxia was doing to teach Zhu Jingyu how to become one of the best Go players in all the land. In this game, they had a really interesting opening here. So Huang Lingxia played this weird-looking empty triangle connect. But the point was to keep a lot of pressure on Black's um, cuts. And so Huang Longshi, I'm sure, anticipated that Zhu Jingyu should play here. This seems like a very natural move. But then he saw that he could play this Hane, and he thought this situation is actually quite annoying for Black. Earlier in the series, we've seen Zhu Jingyu sort of stop attacks that don't matter so much, and then allow attacks that do matter. And so um, earlier in the series, you may have seen Zhu Jingyu play some passive move. In the game, he plays this one, which I think is, is the best move, and it's really sharp. Um, if he had played a move like this instead, it would allow Huang Lingxia to then play from the outside here, slowly start to gather power, right? And then he could just save, and it feels like Huang Lingxia would gain a little bit. But Zhu Jingyu, through this series, has started to understand what attacks he can allow and what attacks he should not allow. And so by playing this move, he demonstrates that he can allow White to cut through like this because he can Hane as his co-threat. This is something that a lot of even modern top-level players miss, actually. I've seen um, high-level pros in modern day try to play a Ko and not really realize that this kind of a Hane threatening to just connect out a weak group or just to, to connect stones that were disconnected before, this is actually a common Ko threat where 
If white would not answer this, it's definitely bigger than normal by a lot. So white needs to answer, and then black can take back the ko, and now white has no ko threat. So I think Huang Lingxia probably didn't recognize how severe the ko threat of playing just a hane under and looking to connect would be. Normally you think of that as something you don't really have to care about so much, but it's true a lot of the time that you do have to care about it in the ko, and you should be thinking of it when you're searching for ko threats. So in this case, Huang Lingxia has basically nothing to do but to take care of his group, just naturally take care by eating that stone and allow Zhuzhing Yu to win this ko in the end. And this position should not be bad for black whatsoever. So this is really well played by Zhu Jingyu. You can see that he's learning from Hong Longsha. Throughout this course of this series, he's been getting better at attacking, he's been getting better at defending, he's been getting better at judgment, at reading. <laughs> he's improving as a player. And Hong Longsha is still trying to fight him as actively as he can. And, he, and Hong Longsha is improving at getting these kinds of active positions. I think now is a good time for me to reveal a quote from Huang Lingxia. One of the the only quotes that I that I have is obviously translated into relatively modern uh, phrase and from Chinese as well. And so this is probably not that close to what Huang Lingxia originally said, but the translation says, to map out a territory, develop through extensions, approach danger only from strongholds, guard what is important. This is the essence of the opening. So note, in this situation, Wang Lusha pincers because he knows he has a stronghold here on the other side. So uh, Huang Lusha is very active in the opening. He would approach danger, but he made sure to do it in situations where he could keep initiative, where he could keep control of the game. And developing through extensions is <laughs> basically in contrast to if you develop without extensions, that's not a very good idea, which we t tend to think, take for granted uh, nowadays, but it was a little bit more popular back then that people would just sort of add another move to themselves without extending very um, harshly. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so this starts another another fight where Huang Yuxia, he has these two weak groups and he should take care of both of them. And Zhu Jingyu attacks them quite actively. I, I'm really quite impressed by Zhu Jingyu's play in this game so far. He's putting a lot of pressure on that Huang Lingxia white group in the upper left. He was saying that was his stronghold, and Zhu Jing is like, how much is your stronghold? Like, how, how much can you really take care of that? Huang Lingxia says, I don't even need to spend a move. <laughs> Which is very, very bold. He means that he has a connection underneath, and if Zhu Jingyu would block the connection underneath, he can fight. And Zhu Jing is like, what do you mean? <laughs> how are you going to fight with that group? Come on, that, that group is surrounded. I'm pretty strong outside. I mean, I have some thin shape, but like, you're, you're dead. And Huang Lingxia plays push, push, cut, Satari, and block. And he makes a capture race. And this kind of capture race is very difficult to read out. Even for, like, in modern times, even for me, I just like, I, my head spins, I get confused, I don't know. <laughs> what you can be pretty sure of is that black should play here. This is a pretty natural move by, by black. You should deny white's chance to get an eye because... If white could get that eye, then, well, it seems pretty clear that white will have some outside liberties, black won't have many outside liberties, and then the inside liberties will be favoring white. It's definitely going to favor white. So this move definitely makes sense from Zhu Jingyu. And then Huang Lingxia played really smartly, really, really clever play from uh, Huang Lingxia here. He played this Hane first. And then black answered, so Huang Lingxia played this Hane. And so black, okay, first he just does this, because he can get white to connect, so that shouldn't be bad. And then he blocks, and then white plays here. So then black captures, and white captures this once. This is just baiting Zhu Jingyu to try to play a co-threat. Because actually black is already dead without ko. <laughs> and you be like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean black is going to die without ko? Well, if black recaptures this ko, first of all, if, if white could have captured that ko, then it would be great for white because white could start to counterattack. That was never an option. But when black recaptures that ko, then white can push first and then play this push. And this actually creates a double ko, which Huang Lingxia had read out from the beginning is why he played a16 was to make it so that there are two ko's to capture now. What I mean is now if black would Atari, white will just capture a ko. And then black can't do anything locally. Black can't connect here, white will Atari, and then black can And black can't Atari here, that's self Atari. So there's nothing for black to do to progress the situation locally. Black can't connect here because white will Atari. So all black can do is play a co-threat somewhere. 
type capture back, and then wait plays this code. And again, black has nothing to do locally to progress the situation. Wait, we'll just kill this group. So this group is dead in double co. <laughs> and Huang Lingxia had read that out, and that's why he played A16, was to make sure there's no co here, just double co. I mean, crazy. <laughs> crazy powerful reading. And Xu Jingyu just goes to attack the other group. Honestly, this is very impressive again by Xu Jingyu, but I mean, <laughs> what Huang just says about the opening, I mean, he plays a pretty good opening, especially for someone who had no idea what AI was, like, <laughs> without even a, uh, uh, an inkling in his mind about anything that, that could be objectively correct. But the middle game here. I want to learn what Hong Xia says about the middle game. So I have the quote here, again translated. What he said before was about the opening. That was kind of true, but, you know, this is what really matters to me. What, what I'm curious to see. What does Hong Xia think matters in the middle game? He says, first of all, areas affect each other. Sharp swords will always come into contact. What he means is... When he's thinking about how the middle game will proceed... He, in general, expects war to break out. Of course, in ancient China, these days we sort of picture them all as having a lot of fighting spirit. They all fought each other a lot harder than modern pros would. But he just anticipates that in such a situation, black and white will just fight against each other. And then he thinks about, how will that look? Right? Well, what's, what's that going to look like? All the sharp swords will come into contact. And I'm thinking about how I can turn that in my favor. He says, if you attack then a single army alone should come forward, it will be all conquering. Huh? <laughs> what does he mean? If you defend, then with one man at the pass, seven heroes will give up. That's an idiom from, from ancient China. Huh? He says, this is because of the influence of the side and center on attack and defense. Huh? <laughs> to me, all of these thoughts are relatively uh, alien. I don't really, I don't really get it. But I can try to explain the best that I can. If you attack, then a single army, a single army alone should come forward. That says Huang Yongshi. To me, what that means is, if you attack, you cannot. Um, um, you, you cannot distract yourself. You have to have an idea of what you are attacking and what you are accomplishing. And if the single army alone will fight and it can fight into any side, then it can do it. It can make it work. When you try to attack from two sides, you will confuse yourself. You let your opponent squirm, right? But if you just say, I'm attacking, this is the one thing which I'm doing, this is the one thing which I'm going to attack, it can work. So in this case, when he attacks, finally, this, this black group, he has only the one fight in mind, which is that I am attacking that one black group. And as long as he just makes this one fight work, it can work, then as long as he fully commits to it, it's hard for black to say that's not going to work, right? So it, if he just attacks with one army, one fight, and he can make that work, it will be all conquering, as long as, you know, it's something he wants to commit to. So it makes sense, right? If you defend, then with one man at the pass, seven heroes will give up. What does that mean? I think this is sort of like imagining a, um, one dude at the center of a bridge, right? Just, you know, valiantly raising his sword and then all the guys at him don't want to come in. <laughs> they don't want to go because they would have to go in one by one or, you know, whatever. To me, what this, this means is that when you defend, again, if you get distracted, you will fail, naturally. So if you defend, you should be able to defend the one thing that you really care about. And as long as that's a task that you want to do, and it's a task that you can do, you will work. It, it, everything will work. And even though your opponent, you know, says, I'm, I'm pressing you from this side, I'm pressing you from that side, I'm pressing you from that side, you just defend the one thing that matters. And if you make that work for yourself, go in. This is because of the influence of the side and center on attack and defense. <laughs> this one to me is very alien. <laughs> it's very alien. But 
I believe what he's talking about is just in general when an attack or defense happens, the influence of the side and center, what he means is the way that the areas affect each other, each of the areas matters, right? There's no area, the side, the center, the, the corner obviously is important, right? There's no area that doesn't matter. And so when you emphasize on all of them, from the beginning, when you come in with the seven heroes, when you come in if, and you get distracted to attack with several armies or something like that, your opponent will find a way to take a victory in some side, some center, in some area. And if you don't get a victory back, then you'll just lose. You just lost value, right? So the point is, I think, that he keeps on emphasizing, you should emphasize on doing your one thing that matters. This is because of the the way that side and center influences the, the attack. He's, he's trying to say that each of these areas that you don't take a loss in, you can continue to play. And the area that you take a victory in, you will control, right? Oh, it's crazy, honestly. Let's, I, I'll continue to share the rest of this, this quote later, but let's continue to see this, this game. So Huang Shi managed to save this group. And then Black played this move. This is really sharp. This is something that is straight from an attacking uh, Tetsuji guidebook. Like, really, really sharp move. White has to play this one, and then to answer. Uh, it makes it makes sense. If uh, White would have done something differently here, I think a lot of people like the block. There's this attachment, critical move from Black. Of course, if Black, you know, <laughs> gets the cut, then White will die. So, if White would just have to fall back here. White will probably also die. So it makes a lot of sense for Huang Longsha to play this bump. He's preventing Black from doing this connection. But Black is like, I'm going to do the connection anyway. Ha ha. And then White is like, no, you aren't. Come on. And Huang Longsha is like, uh, I mean, Zhu Jingyu is like, yeah, I'm not. Never mind. <laughs> so in this situation, Huang Longsha, you know, critically defended his one group. And he got the value from that. Now he has to go do something else. Because actually Zhu Jingyu managed to find the corner. I don't know what was up with Zhu Jingyu, but... He managed to find these quarter moves a lot better than Huang Longshi did, and he gained a lot every time in each of these games when he managed to go to the 3-3. Three, three. Huang Longshi instead just takes some influence, and Zhu Jingyu denies the influence. Honestly, this is this looks like a, a common, you know, modern territorial player playing. Uh, Zhu Jingyu is doing very well here. Um, he did die in the upper left, so he's lost value from the beginning, for sure. But the way he's playing since then, this all is making a lot of sense. I mean, look at that. He took another 3-3. Three, three. He he knew that this Joseki, which Huang Longsha keeps playing against him, this is bad for White. I mean, this is every time that he that Huang Longsha is doing this, Xu Jingyu gets an advantage back because I mean the territory that Black gets is just not matched by by the power that White has. And um, so <laughs> Black took another extension. He's even attacking those uh, those two White stones, and White has to say that they're strong already in Pincer because White has to make something happen. To be honest, this. This last passage of play, I think this made the game extremely hard for Huang Yingxia. I think if he would have more quickly just taken his stones on the sides first, like instead of playing a commitment to the center here, just play a stone on the side somewhere, man. And again, here, you, you play the stone that forces him to the corner, just play the stone in the corner yourself and let him like commit to the side and then break it later or something. Like It feels from this moment... This feels like an extremely hard fight to control when, when Zhu Jingyu is just running up like this. And Huang Longsha is clearly behind in in power. He has these two weak groups that he has to take care of. One in the um one on the right side, one in the upper right. And then he even has another weak group here on the on the bottom side. I mean black has some weakness, but he's gonna be fine in general. And he plays this great striking move as well. Zhu Jingyu is doing a much better job of taking initiative in those situations where he's supposed to have an attack by just waiting instead of being so crazy like he was before. Sometimes he would just like dive at Huang Lixia, swipe some knives at him and something. He just sits in front of him now and he says, you have the two weak groups. I build my power against them. What are you going to do? Uh, Huang Lixia is like, well, <laughs> if I just take care of that much, I'll still lose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dare even harder. This is Huang Lixia doing this stuff that he um, 
he wasn't doing in the first couple of games, and he's doing it better. He's doing it just like he was in the games that he was winning throughout the series. He's getting more territory, and he's daring Zhu Jin Yu, hey, kill me. <laughs> kill me if you can. I don't think you can. Go for it. And so he takes a bit of extra shape, and then he takes care of this group. Kill me if you can. How are you going to do it? Zhu Jin Yu just waits. This is much higher level play from both of them compared to how it used to be. The problem is, because Zhu Jing Yu is playing high level, and just waiting here, not doing anything. Huang Shu can't quite get any weaknesses. He can't get any of those critical um, details to fall in his favor because Zhu Jing Yu isn't just letting the details be important. He's just chilling. He's just defending himself. He plays this Hane here and this Atari, and he plays here very, very nicely. This allows White to capture those two stones on the top side, but Zhu Jing Yu read that. And Huang Lun did not capture that. He did some other move. Why didn't he play this? I mean, this works. You do this, push, boom, 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 boom. Nice. Well, if Huang Lun would have done that, then Zhu Jing Yu could cut. And Huang Lun would have to capture these two stones for this to make sense. But then Black has that Atari as his right. That's his forcing move. So Black can just like fix this cut and those three stones are just dead. Huh? Well, then how do I play the game? Huang Yusho, his whole point was like, you can't kill me, you can't kill me. And then suddenly he's dying. So he's like, well, I, um, I guess I should get something from that and I should like not commit to those stones on the top side. So let me just like attach and attach and maybe you'll mess this up. And Black connects and he does this one. And now this is actually kind of tricky for, for Black. There's a couple ways that Black can mess this up, but he just pushes. He's so chill. And Zhu Jing Yu is just attacking by sitting in front of Huang Yusho and saying, I'm fine, you're not. It was so nice. Because these, I mean, these stones are just dead, to be honest. The Huang Yusho should not be able to save the stones. He just plays away. <sighs> Huang Yusho lost the fight. He lost it really bad. In fact, Black is leading, even if the uh, initial position had been even. Like, <laughs> like, Black has gained from the beginning of the game, despite dying on the left. Because White died on the upper right. And so what was Huang Shou supposed to do? He was supposed to sacrifice those stones if, if Zhu Jing Yu would play that sharply and like just take the top side instead. But there's no way that you can do that and then win the three stone game. What was Huang Shou actually supposed to do? He was just supposed to not let Zhu Jing Yu get that kind of an attacking position if he was going to play the attack so well. <laughs> Easier said than done. The game continues. Some interesting things happen here. Wang Yusho is tricking a little bit, Zhu Jing Yu, and he manages to capture this stone and look towards some cuts there. So he manages to get a lot of extra power with his weak group. That was nice, but he is also potentially getting squeezed. And if he would just handle this, if you just save this group naturally, play some shape move, and he dies over here, and he dies over here, he loses. So he's like, all right, time to start a fight. <laughs> I gotta do something. And Zhu Jingyu just runs. Look at this move. This is how Zhu Jingyu has improved throughout this series. It's so beautiful. I just sit here, I make you play the sad answering move, and then cut, and now I have a strong position in the center. You're not going to attach me. I, I'm, I'm out in the center. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, fi I'm fine everywhere. You're not. What are you going to do? Huang Yusha plays this peep, and he plays this block. Makes sense. Makes sense. Zhu Jing Yu just does this. Because those three stones on the top are captured, all he has to do, Zhu Jing Yu, is make sure that he's fine with his stones in the center, he's fine over here, and that he keeps the attacks going. So this move is just powerful for the attack because it captures these stones so so comfortably, so well, efficiently. Zhu Jing Yu is so calm this game. He's not doing anything wrong. Let's go hear some of Huang Lingxia's quotes again. What is it that Zhu Jing Yu learned? What is it that Zhu Jing Yu learned from Huang Lingxia? What did Huang Lingxia tell him? If territory is balanced, he who obtains thickness is the stronger. Okay. If thickness is equal, he who uses his brain will be victorious. It is important to fight for the initiative. What Zhu Jing Yu learned was his thickness exists. His thickness advantage exists and it can be nurtured. It doesn't need to be uh, crushed with, he just needs to use his brain to make it work. <laughs> All he has to do is to nurture his thickness to win the game. That's what he's doing with this move. Look at the, look at this move. This is 
just chilling, saying, I have the territory advantage, I have the thickness advantage, I am winning. The game is over. Not because I have three stones from the beginning, but because my position is winning, and I understand why. That's what Zhu understands now, and I think that he didn't understand at the beginning why is his three stone position winning. He thought it was because he can win the fights, but it's not. It's because you can nurture the position that your position is winning. Be unwilling to lag behind, strive to gain the initiative. You've seen how Huang Nongshu has done that with every move here. He's always striving, sometimes failing, but striving, trying all the time. He didn't capture those two sons at the top because he wanted to gain the initiative. He wanted to make sure that he would have the one who has the truth, because, let's listen to his last quote here. True and false, the subtleties of proceeding straight or indirectly can be distinguished only by the merits of what is given up and what is captured. All right, let me, let me say that again a little, a little faster. True and false, and the subtleties of proceeding straight or indirectly. So this is what is correct, what is, what is real, what is not real, and what kind of path should you take. Can be distinguished only, so how to figure out what is real. How does Huang Nisho figure out what is real? What is, what is the difference between the subtleties and, and what, is the, what makes him choose one move over another if it's close? can be distinguished only by the merits of what is given up and what is captured. So he only judges truth, falsity, the reality of a position. He's only thinking about it in terms of what has happened to my position. The merits of, has my position taken a sacrifice? Has my position taken an advantage? Something like that. And when he judges all these little details, He's always very, very clever, very sharp to how that affects the global picture. And this is why. It's because every time he's trying to figure out true or false with the subtleties, every time he's choosing a path for himself throughout the game, he's considering the merits of what's being given up and what is captured. So what is dying, what's being given, <laughs> right? What's alive and what's, what's being taken. Fighting for the initiative to take those things, that's his main strategy to win the game. And that, that is what he's been teaching Zhu Jingyu. Zhu Jingyu is recognizing, I don't need to fight for anything here because I'm already capturing the things. I have the initiative. So if I fight, if I capture something, if I, if I would give something up to capture something, I would just lose because it's already captured. So Zhu Jingyu is just waiting here, he's nurturing his position because he understands that the merits that he gains by doing those crazy things he was doing earlier in the series is nothing compared to what he already has. This game was honestly not exciting. And that's credit to Zhu Jingyu. He does this push and cut to say, hey, now you almost saved yourself, right? You almost saved yourself on the top side. I almost saved myself in the center. Now is the time where if I strike, I can gain something. Are you going to save those two stones? If you don't save the two stones, then I can take something. Ah, oh, I have to save the two stones this long. I have to, I have to make sure that I commit. But then... Black of Atari. White tried. White tried really hard to make a trick. The reason why he did this is because he knew if I come back, then White... I mean, definitely Black is going to play that Atari. I can play this peep, and then when Black answers, because they definitely want to save their stones, I can extend, and then I have this thing where I'm going to play this Atari back. So Black needed to push here one time first, rather than to get himself in, in a lot of danger of, of getting squeezed and getting co and, and, and not having fun. He needed to push here. It was definitely better to make his shape bigger. But wait, did this one to say, I have a co. Yeah? If wait would have captured those two stones, he would have gotten squeezed from the outside and killed. So he had to run out, make sure he's not, you know, not dead. And then there's this Ko. And you know what finally bites Huang Shi? The reason why he can't win this game, even though he makes this Ko for all of this to turn back in his favor for him to eventually get a counterattack in the center. He can't win this Ko because in the beginning, he captured a group in double Ko. <laughs> so wait, just... Black starts the double co. Wait has to give up either the group on the left side or the group in the center. He chooses not to give up the group on the left side. And what that means is eventually he gives up the group in the center. 
this is all blacks. All, all that in the upper right is clean. And to be honest, Black didn't even need to fill this code because he always had the double code. <laughs> he could have like, <laughs> he, he just left that and done the other stuff. But the reason why Zhu Yu played like this is because he knows now the position is not close. Black has such a territory lead. Black has the entire upper right corner and, and Wei has nothing. So Huang Yusha keeps playing a little while, but this game was never close. Zhu Yu learned how to play. You know, uh, we've been ragging on Zhu Yu this whole time. It's easy to forget that he became, later in life, a Guo Shuo. He became the best player in China. Still, everyone thought he was no good <laughs> compared to Huang Yusha. But this is a game where he's really growing into himself and trying to become a, a properly good player. And I can respect it. Finally, sometime after this, um, the, the rest of the game is lost, but finally... Jujing Yu won by Resignation. A great game, honestly. Well played by Jujing Yu. He just fought that right side very well. There was no opening for Huang Lingxia from the moment that he let Jujing Yu take the corners. <laughs> Luckily, the last game is perhaps the most interesting of the entire set. And the story that still remains to be told is why I have enjoyed recording these the most of all the videos I've produced. And so this next video is extremely interesting and I hope that you stick around and, and see the 10th game of Blood and Tears. I'm looking so, so much forward to it. See you there.